सर आज हम नॉर्वे की एक वीडियो देखने वाले हैं जिसमें हम देखेंगे कि नॉर्वे का गांव कैसा नजर आता है अच्छा यानी कि यूरोप का एक गांव है जो कैसा नजर आता है ओ हो हो मैं चाहूंगा कि आप इस वीडियो को देखें और इस पर अपनी प्रतिक्रिया दें मैं यहां अपन अभी तो हिंदुस्तान का हवा देखें हवा जो हम यूरोप का गांव देखेंगे तो उसे तक कोई नया पन देखने को मिल जाए बाबू भाई या तो तुम्हारी आदत कमजोर है तुम बुजुर्ग हो गए तुम मेरे साथ बैठ के यहां पर बहुत सी चीजें देख चुके हो यूरोप की और अपने वीडियो में कई बार देख चुके शायद तुम भूल चुके होगे यूरोप के कई गांव देखे अपने हो और ये तो ये ठीक ही ठीक है थाईलैंड के गांव भी दिखा दिए तुम्हारे हवा में अब और क्या लोग है तुम हवा में देख रहे हैं कि एक जो अपनी आंखों से In this documentary, we'll explore daily life in two coastal villages on the west coast of Norway, one of which has a population of just 53 inhabitants. We'll take you on a tour of a typical Norwegian apartment, and we'll also examine phenomena such as the northern lights, sun pillars, and the midnight sun. Finally, we'll take a dive into Norway's outdoors culture and its fishing and farming industries. How are you, Bob? But before we begin, how did I, a Londoner, end up staying on the coast of Norway for three years? The story begins in 2016. This is me back then, a time when I was full of confidence and didn't need to suck in my gut for selfies. I'm on Tinder, furiously swiping right to any woman who appears to have most of her teeth when I come across a profile 1,300 kilometers away. An Indian in Norway? Interesting. I'm not sure about the green hair color, but I swipe right because she appears to have an impressive tooth to gum ratio. Seriously, I put that in my profile. We match, and I charm her with a dazzling display of wit and humor. She's like, "Oh my God, you're so cool and British and sophisticated." Not knowing that within weeks, I'd have no reservations about taking a shit in front of her while she brushed her teeth. We organize a date in London, which goes fantastically well, but we've got a problem. I live in London, a global city with a population of nine million, and I dare say, the capital of Europe. While she lives in a Norwegian coastal village 450 kilometers south of the bloody Arctic Circle. Now, as a man, I had to ask myself some tough questions. Just how far am I willing to travel for coitus? What I learned about myself is that I am in fact able to travel a remarkable distance for coitus. So thanks to the blessed EU and both of us being self-employed, we began a relationship. One where I would spend two consecutive weekends in Norway, we would spend the next weekend apart, and then she would come to London for the next two weekends. So just how remote could this village be? Door to door, the journey went something like this. I'd walk seven minutes to the bus stop, take a 20-minute bus to the airport, check in, whoa, take a two-hour flight from Heathrow to Oslo, lay over for two to six hours, yeah, take yeah. a 45-minute flight from Oslo to Ålesund, take a one-hour bus, bus ride from the airport to a local shopping centre, wait for 30 to 90 minutes, take another one-hour bus ride from the shopping yeah, centre yeah, yeah. to the village, and finally summon the will to walk the last 15 minutes to her place. Yeah. Without further ado, welcome to Bratvog. If you're thinking it sounds like something from an IKEA catalogue, you'd be right. It actually is. If you're in Norway, you might have seen the news in January 2021. Yes, yes, 38 teenagers had a house party that was broken up by the police. Bratvog is a coastal industrial village that lives in the shadow of Hellandshorne, a dramatic mountain 882 meters high. Bratvog has a population of 2,448 in an area covering 1.74 square kilometers. It was first settled on November 11th, 1911 by Anna and Iver Shelton. And unbelievably, that house still stands in its original location, although I'm not too sure about that. Norway's history actually begins on the west coast. As the last ice age ended, hunter-gatherers migrated along the coastline, living off the land and hunting for fish, seals, and reindeer. Fast forward until the industrial revolution, and the local economy consists of farming, fishing, timber, mining, and textiles. Then, of course, came the discovery of petroleum in the 60s, which completely transformed the region. Today, the maritime industry is represented in Brattvåg with a ferry port, shipyard. A Rolls-Royce factory and Bratvog Electric. We have to be the only maritime electrical company to have their own theme song publicly available on YouTube. It's utterly insane. I'll leave a link in the description. Let's take a walk from the flat to the village center. Now, you might think of villages as being backwards with poor infrastructure, but you'd be wrong. Bratvog has good transport links, fast broadband, and several services you would expect to find in a city, albeit on a smaller scale. As we approach the village center, there's a Rema Tours and supermarket, a car rental company called Good Car, and a 650 capacity church, built in 1977 and presumably designed by the architect of the Death Star. West Norway is overwhelmingly Christian. In fact, the West Coast, the South Coast, joined to form Norway's Babel Belt, but without the casual racism. The church used to have an ominous green light at night. But these days, it's a more inviting yeah, yeah. floodlight. Uh, in the center, you'll find yeah. everything from luxury apartments to an abandoned house, three schools, a local newspaper, a shopping mall with a Wien monopoly, and a co-op inside. 
And they're building this new parking area and this new area for more. Yeah. This is the old park. The local Achha. government has an office along with a police station with apartments. Station the apartment. For entertainment, there's a trend to the ambulance. Bhi dikhri this place is a bar, burger restaurant, and a bowling alley. Achha, achha, manon jan. Friday night. Gazab, 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 gazab. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, marne ka. Oh, oh, oh. Ah, ye marne ka gain marne. Aba gaon ke andar chiza banati tumne ya? Hamara bade shuru hoti. With a capacity of 91, it usually shows one or two movies on Wednesdays and Sundays. If you don't feel like cooking, you have to choose a local <laughs> cafe, a Thai restaurant, and a pizza and kebab restaurant. I was shocked to learn that, like 95% of the electricity produced in Norway, Brothvog is powered by hydroelectricity. Oh. Just like the UK, yeah, right, Norway's yeah. healthcare doesn't cover dental treatments, although oh. we have fixed prices for common oh. procedures. Here's a comparison of what you might pay. ये ever wanted where the Scandinavian homes look like IKEA showrooms, well, you'd be right. Like many other homes, Biku's apartment has large windows, white walls, wooden floors, a minimalist interior, and an absolutely breathtaking coastal view. Her two-bedroom apartment was a spacious 100 square meters and cost approximately 700 pounds per month, excluding bills, which works out to about 7 pounds per square meter. On the edge of Greater London, a two-bedroom 75 square meter flat would be about 1,300 pounds, or 17 pounds 33 per square meter. Acha, acha, rising acha. to 2,700 pounds or 36 pounds per square meter in Kensington and Chelsea. One area where Norway truly excells in is promotion <laughs> balance. Biku's schedule looked like this. Meanwhile, when I used to work in an office, oh, time to go, time to go. Like <laughs> the shorter working hours and brief commute contribute to having <laughs> almost double the amount of precious free time. This is probably <laughs> the single <laughs> most important reason why Norwegians are so happy. We could cook healthy meals from scratch instead of shoving something in the oven for 20 minutes at 180 degrees Celsius. We could binge watch a show, play lengthy co-op campaign games, and take the time to fully explore our hobbies. Hello, Sangeet, your song. What do you say? Which one? It's difficult to find climate data for Brooklyn, so, so we use the neighboring city or listen for comparison. Although you might associate Norway with sub-zero temperatures, Excuse the Gulf Stream warms the coastline by about 5 degrees Celsius, whoa, which is significant whoa, whoa. for a city that lies on the same latitude whoa, whoa, whoa. as the Yukon. Now, being British, you could say I'm somewhat used to unpredictable weather and perpetually Jeezy. overcast days. However, the weather in Norway was... temperamental. With an average high of 16 degrees Celsius in August, it never quite reaches comfortable t-shirt and shorts weather compared to London's 23 degrees Celsius. I think the Gulf Stream's warming chata. effect is more obvious in winter though, with only a 1 degree London difference in temperature London from London. So British London. weather is synonymous with rain. There's even a song called Rainy Day in London. <laughs> it comes as no surprise that London receives 106 days of rain from the year. I was startled to find out Orlison receives an astounding 269 days of rain from every year. <laughs> I couldn't find exact figures for snowfall. Wait, like it did not footage when it did snow. The snow completely transformed the village into a winter wonderland. The wind was also unpredictable. You could experience anything from a gentle breeze to this. Then a matter of minutes. Even when we were out shooting for this documentary, we were hit by a hailstorm. The wind was punishing, painfully whipping the stones into our faces. Next, the sun. You can expect 1,180 hours of sunshine in August versus 1,481 in London. There's a large difference in daylight hours over the course of the year. On the summer solstice, Orlesund will have 20 hours of daylight versus over 16 and a half in London. Whereas on the winter solstice, Orlesund will have just under 5 hours of daylight versus almost 8 in London. Brotvog's latitude and geography means you'll experience a range of meteorological phenomena you won't get in London. It's not quite in the Arctic Circle, so you won't get to experience the midnight sun, but instead you'll get something arguably better. Midnight yeah, twilight. Yeah. 10.40 at the moment. And this... Uh, this is scenery. Yeah, this is crazy. 
The sun dips below the horizon, but the sky, instead of going dark, becomes bathed in a vivid warm glow until the sun rises again. It's incredibly beautiful, but equally disorienting. So the locals have blackout blinds so they can maintain dark conditions in their bedrooms. You can also see the infamous northern lights in Brazil. They weren't intense enough for real-time video, but I was able to capture them with a long exposure photo. If you're lucky, you might come across a sun pillar. It's a somewhat rare phenomenon where suspended ice crystals reflect light from the sun, forming a bright pillar of light that looks like it belongs in a fantasy movie. Coined by the Norwegian playwright Henrik Ibsen, Friluftsliv is often translated as open air In practice, it means disconnecting from the stresses of society, taking part in regular outdoor activities and connecting with nature. Friluftsliv is perfectly encapsulated in a Norwegian saying, which translates to there is no such thing as bad weather, only bad clothing. In kindergarten, children spend 70% of the time outdoors in summer and 30% outdoors in winter. When they're a bit older, they learn the or Norwegian mountain code. It's similar to our countryside code, but accounts for the harsher conditions present in Norway. In Norway, it's completely normal for children to walk to and from school alone, climb trees on school property without being told off, and to go on annual ski trips with their classmates. Biko explained that her school would organize trips to the woods every fortnight. That's two freedom weeks for my American viewers. There, they would learn to take part in activities such as orienteering, learning how to start a fire and cooking food that they brought from home. One popular snack was or stick bread. After preparing the dough at home, children would locate branches in the woods, sharpen the ends into skewers, wrap the dough around the branch and then bake it over a fire. What are your favorite memories of outdoorsy school trips? Let me know in the comments. Free Luth sleeve education doesn't stop in childhood though. You can take a bachelor's and even master's in it. In adult life, according to The Guardian, the average Norwegian visits the great outdoors three times a week. And according to Visit Norway, it's not uncommon for Norwegians to go hiking or cycling on a first date. Friluftsliv is enshrined in law as Allemannsretten or every man's right, which allows public access to all non-cultivated land. It means you can wild camp in any place you like for one night, as long as you are at least 150 meters away from an inhabited house or cabin. You can also swim in most waters, forage in the forests, and fish for saltwater species without a license, as long as it's for personal consumption. If you're thinking to yourself, well that's all fine and dandy, but what about the goddamn polar bears, man? Don't worry, there aren't any on the mainland. Ah, With a coastline of 83,281 kilometers, Norway has the second longest coastline in the world due to the combination of its rugged terrain and 50,000 islands. It has a history of fishing going back to the Stone Age and in 1946 it was the first country to establish a ministry of fisheries. Today, the seafood industry has 6,200 registered vessels and employs 11,230 fishermen. It's the world's second largest exporter of seafood, accounting for 7.9% of all of Norway's exports in 2017. Norwegians eat just under 20 kilograms of fish and fish products per capita. Here's a breakdown of consumption by species. You wouldn't think something as ubiquitous as salmon is but it's true. In the 1970s, Norway began commercial salmon farming, but Norwegians have begun to change their dietary habits, increasing their intake of meat and poultry. By the 80s, surplus salmon was being stored in industrial freezers, while, halfway across the world, Japan had overfished its waters to the point where it was only able to supply 50% of its domestic demand. Codenamed Project Japan, the Norwegian fishing industry came together to sell raw salmon exclusively for U.S. sushi, which would command a premium price. After several years of meetings and failed marketing exercises, they finally broke through in 1992. Fast forward to today, and Japan's most popular sushi topping, accounting for 140 million pounds in trade between Norway and Japan in 2014. If you thought Brotvog was remote, we're going to take a fjord cruise to a place even more remote, Utke, a village with a population of 53. No, that's not a typo. While we make our way there, let's talk a little about farming in Norway. Every aspect of Norway's history and culture is shaped by its unique geography. To understand why, take a look at the following table. Despite Norway's vast areas of wilderness, only 2.7% or 10,400 square kilometers of its land is suitable for agriculture, an area about the size of Cyprus. Of that area, only a third is suitable for crops. Most of the 40,000 farms in Norway are family-owned, small to medium-sized, with an average area of 0.25 square kilometers, or about 34 football pitches. Uh, proper football, not American football. The growing season, defined as the number of days with an average temperature of at least 5 degrees Celsius, varies from between 90 days in the north to about 160 days in the south. These geographical quirks affect Norway in obvious and not so obvious ways. Historically, it's one of the reasons the Vikings left their shores for Britain, the availability of productive farmland. 
In 2011, it manifested itself in the Norwegian butter crisis. A heavy summer rainfall caused a milk production shortfall of 20 million liters, at the same time as increased demand for high fat diets. On top of this, Norway heavily taxed imported butter to protect Tine, its nationalized dairy company. This led to soaring butter prices, empty shelves, and enterprising oh, individuals oh. even being arrested for smuggling butter across the border. Food self-sufficiency is a measure of how well a country can feed itself, and Norway has one of the lowest values in the West at around 50%, meaning half of its food is imported. The scarcity of agricultural land is the reason that farming in Norway is heavily subsidized, to a tune of 60% of gross farming income. In 2019, the entire agricultural industry accounted for 1.3% of Norway's GDP, a value of 3.8 billion pounds. We made it to Utke. In 2016, Utke had a population of 53, which consisted of 10 children, 31 adults and 12 seniors. 14 of them were active workers and 20 people from outside Urke owned cabins in which they would regularly stay. In Urke, we can really see self-sufficiency in action. The locals run a fishery and also fish from the fjord. There's a communal market oh. garden which has fresh vegetables and livestock grazed in the valley grass. There's a hydroelectric plant for power and a community house for recreation. There are also several outdoor activities you could start from Urke. Hiking, cycling, swimming, foraging, and fishing boat trips. In a way, the lifestyle of the people here hasn't changed since farming was introduced to Norway. They still live off the land in a seasonal cycle, with the coast providing them with fish, domesticated animals producing milk, and the land providing grains and root vegetables. But what about winter? Before refrigeration, harsh conditions meant food had to be stored to last throughout the winter. But this wasn't possible without preserving them. It was these conditions that gave birth to some of Norway's most iconic dishes, such as... Gravlax. Salmon, which is salted and Salman. traditionally fermented by burying it in sand. Rakfisk. Trout, which is salted and fermented for up to a year. Kripfisk. Cod, which is dried and salted in the open air. Susil. Pickled herring. <laughs> if you watched our Christmas in Norway episode, you'll recognize the next two dishes. Whitefish, <laughs> White fish, which is salted and preserved in lye. <laughs> Lamb ribs, which are dried, salted and smoked. <laughs> Additionally... Milk became processed into butter and cheese, and grains became flatbread and crisp bread. Sometimes these cold conditions even worked in the farmer's favor. For instance, fish could be dried in the open air. But where was the food stored? These well, storage houses can still be found today, identifiable by the elevated stone columns. You might even notice one of them in Bratvog. If you look closely, you'll notice that the top stone is wider than the others. This was a way to prevent rodents climbing up. And on that cheesy note, let's head back to Brothfog during our last days there. We're at Pad Thai, having our last meal together before Biko moved to London to be with me. Our last meal in Brothfog. Classic Pad Thai. We've had several eggs. Sweet, sour, salty, spicy. Rams, if you're watching this, this is how you do it. <coughs> what the crap you made. Uh -huh. mm. A cold, dark day like this, this is the perfect food. It warms the soul. <laughs> it was time for me to head back to London. <laughs> this is it. The last time I'm going to see these mountains. However, West Norway had one last surprise for me. Just as the plane took off into a rain drizzle sunset, I looked out the window to see a rainbow briefly falling in the land, bathed in that warm glow I mentioned earlier in the documentary. And just like that, it was <laughs> In the next episode of the series, it's summer. <laughs> बाबू अभी तक मैंने नार्वे की लाइट वाली वीडियो देखी इसके अलावा भी विकल्प बहुत से अलग मैंने यूरोप के गांव की वीडियो देखी पर ये जो विस्तार से जिस हिसाब से बताई और चीजें एक चीज उससे मतलब ऐसा लगा बाबू कि मुझे शिमला मनाली की कहीं ना कहीं मुझे याद आ गई जो अपने हिंदुस्तान में और मुझे सबसे ज्यादा हैरानी हुई कि समुद्र वहां मौजूद है तो समुद्र के बीच में पहाड़ क्या कर रही है बर्फ का पर पर यहाँ पर जैसे कि पहाड़ भी हैं बादल भी गुजर रहा है क्योंकि ऊंचे पे होगा वो लेकिन वहाँ समुद्र है 
तो समुद्र का तल मिल गया जमीन से तो फिर वहाँ ठंड भी पड़ रही तो वो मतलब अजीब गरीब चीज देख ली आपको मिली में अजीब गरीब चीज है वो सीखने के लिए वो जो तुमने ये देख कर सीख ली ना अब वो आगे ऐसी बात मत करना ये चीज सीखने के लिए मिलती है अपने वो सर मतलब देखो आप उस गाँव के अंदर क्या चीज मौजूद नहीं थी बड़े बड़े शहरों के अंदर नहीं होती वो चीज वो आप गाँव में सरकार द्वारा मुहैया करा दी गई सरकार को मुहैया इसलिए करा दी कि इन लोगों को इतनी दूर नहीं आना पड़े हाँ जरा ये वीडियो होगी खत्म आप मेरा कर बड़ी दूर से आए हैं प्यार का तो पलाए बड़ी दूर से आए हैं प्यार का तो पलाए अपना लो या ठुकरा दो प्यार का तो बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद